This was his updated the Archimedes screw. The Archimedes screw was a design used to get water from a ground floor level to a second or third floor level. What this design was supposed to do and designed to do was as the workman turned this screw-like device and design, it was designed to pick up a cup of water and a bubble of air. A cup of water and a bubble of air and the bubble of water would move the water up to the second or third floor level. Leonardo da Vinci figured out how to waterproof leather by coating it with animal fat. He designed the original life preserver. The design hasn't been approved upon in over 550 years. As much as Leonardo da Vinci wanted to fly, he wanted to go under the sea. And he knew that you had to breathe in fresh air, and you had to expel the old air. He even designed something that suspiciously resembles our regulators of today. That's a great trivia question. Who invented our regulators of today? It was Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau invented our regulators of, of today. So just file that away. You never know when you need it. But in all of his writings, Leonardo da Vinci wrote that he thought this design looked very sinister and very evil. And he wrote in his codices, due to the very evil nature of man, somebody would surely take this invention and try to hurt someone with it. And unfortunately for us, he completely abandoned the entire project because he thought someone would take this and actually try to harm someone. So we had to wait another 500 years for Jacques Cousteau to invent the regulator. Since the tour has begun, you've heard me say the word CODIS quite a bit. A CODIS is basically a large book of the day. When Leonardo da Vinci died, they put all of his drawings into these huge things called CODISes. In 1966, a monk was going through one of Leonardo da Vinci's old codices that had been gone through a thousand times before. As he was paging through the book, he felt that one of the pages in the book felt a little bit thicker than the other pages. He thought that was a little strange, so he began to play with the page and he began to peel it apart. And as he began to peel it apart, he discovered that there had been two pages that had been stuck together for over 500 years. Do you know what was on the other page? The bicycle. Leonardo da Vinci designed the original bicycle. But more important than inventing the bicycle was he invented the link chain that operated it. As the energy is being created, it's being transferred from one gear to another gear to another gear to help sustain this task easily. Leonardo's biggest problem was he couldn't make the chain because casting hadn't evolved that far yet. So they theorized that he used rope and leather and straps and strings to perform this function. In 1497, Leonardo da Vinci designed the original ball bearing. Over the last 550 years, the material has changed, the manufacturing processes have changed, but his basic design has withstood the test of time. I was giving this one tour to this group of eighth graders not too long ago, and I asked them simply during my tour, I said, hey, where do we use the ball bearing? And all 30 of them, there were 15 guys and 15 girls, they all looked at me like they didn't know what I was talking about, and they said, I don't know. And I went, oh my goodness, in every wheel that turns has a ball bearing. Every car wheel, every manufacturing wheel, every rollerblade, every bicycle, every skateboard has a ball bearing. Every wheel that turns around in a circle has a ball bearing. And Leonardo da Vinci designed it. They have been able to improve upon it in 500 years. This is Leonardo da Vinci's famous gear study. This is predecessor to all of our modern day gearing system, all of our modern day cars. As the energy is being created by the workmen, it's being transferred from one gear to another gear to another gear and being able to be sustained easily. On Leonardo da Vinci's own design, he figured out very quickly there were two major problems with his own design. First of all, the problem was that the friction in it would wear it down. The second problem was if one or two or three or four of the teeth broke off on the gears, the entire gear would shut down. You know what? Leonardo da Vinci figured that out. He was Leonardo da Vinci. He designed what he called the original worm screw that we call the corkscrew mechanism. As the energy is being created by the workmen, the energy is being transferred from the worm screw to the gear. There's many different points of contact, much less friction. If one or two or three or four of the teeth broke off, it wouldn't necessarily have shut the gear down. But the most ingenious part about this design was what? That it was an one-way transfer. The energy could be transferred from the worm screw to the gear, but it cannot be transferred in reverse. Where do we use that design every day in our life? Every guitar, every bass, every violin, every cello, every stringed musical instrument uses this exact design. 
1497 was a very good year for Leonardo da Vinci. He designed the original ball bearing and he also designed the original cam hammer. What it was, was he figured out by cutting the arc of the wood, as the workman turned the cam hammer device, he would draw the hammer back the same way every time. So you could now have consistent, even pressure, and you could now control the production process. Leonardo da Vinci's first passion in life was painting. His second passion was flight. But his third passion was he wanted to find the secret to perpetual motion. He had small, medium, and large perpetual motion machines. As one weight would drop, it would be replaced by another weight, and another weight, and another weight. And theoretically, it would just keep going, and going, and going, and going. After years of study, experimentation, and trial and error, he finally came to the conclusion that what? It doesn't exist. At some point, some energy has to be put back in the system to keep it operating. As we know now, Leonardo da Vinci made his money by doing his military machine designs. He also made his money by doing portraits. He had a waiting list of people that wanted to be painted by him. In fact, the last year and a half, they just found another one of his portraits called La Bella Principessa. You can Google it, it's all over the internet. They've now determined it's a Leonardo original and by his hand. And you know what he wanted to do with this huge backlog of portraits that uh, he had commissioned to paint? He wanted to speed it up. He wanted to get the commission, he wanted to get the painting done. He wanted to get paid. He wanted to get on to his next project. So to help him do that, he designed this mirror chamber. The subject could walk into the mirror chamber. He would close the door. He would look through from the outside. He could see around the subject 360 degrees, not have to move his palette, not have to stand up. He could now paint faster and get the job done sooner. I'm actually looking for over the couple of years, a modern day application of this device. And really what it is kind of like is the first remote control. Because really he's sitting down and everything else is going on around him. But they didn't have this next expression back then. But by today's standards, you know what this is truly an example of? Thinking outside the box. Leonardo da Vinci thought outside the box for this one. Getting into the heart of Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci was left-handed. You know what left, being left-handed meant back then? The sign of the devil, the mark of the devil, and all the writing instruments were set up for right-handed people. So if you were left-handed and you were using a writing instrument of the day and you wrote left to right like we do, it would smear the page. So Leonardo da Vinci th taught himself to write left-handed backwards from right to left. They call that mirror script. At the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci, they teach young students that every year, and they teach them to do the young students with mirrors. They hold a mirror up to the right-hand side of the page, and they write from right to left. Can you think of another reason why he wanted to do that? His own copyright. If somebody ran off with his drawings, they'd have a very, very hard time figuring it out. As you may know, Leonardo da Vinci did the first major anatomical drawings in history. In fact, all of our medical drawings today are based upon his original drawings. His best friend died at an early age, and he wondered why his best friend passed away. Leonardo da Vinci performed an autopsy on his best friend. What was that problem? It was against the law. It was a criminal offense, but he didn't care. He wanted to find out why his best friend passed away. He performed an autopsy on his best friend. Can you imagine? He cut open his best friend. He found his best friend's heart, found all the arteries going to his best friend's heart were what? Clogged and he theorized, and probably correctly, that what his best friend had eaten had killed him. And after that, he became a strict vegetarian. And he lived to be 67 years of age, which was very long for back then. His own apprentices turned him in, and the last years of his life, he had to move from Italy to France, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Very recently, 60 Minutes did a magazine article called The Monks of Mount Athos. And Google this when you get a chance. I'd, like, I'd love you to pull it up. 60 Minutes sent a film crew over to the Monks of Mount Athos Monastery where they have been living the same way above the Aegean Sea for the last 550 years. They grow all their own fruits, all their own vegetables, all their own herbs. And you know what? They have no cancer. They have no heart disease. They have no Alzheimer's. So Leonardo da Vinci was right 550 years ago to eat well and to take great care of yourself. What's the problem that's happened over the last 550 years? What's changed? Nothing. We're still eating what's killing us.
tell the young students that come by this exhibit, they walk by this particular exhibit and they, and they, and they take one look at it and they think, oh, this is nothing. You know what this nothing did? This nothing changed the world that we live in. Leonardo da Vinci figured out by attaching levers to the back of a turning wheel, you would turn circular motion into lineal energy. The locomotive, the internal combustion engine, the piston is all based on this theory and design. Leonardo da Vinci figured out by attaching weights to a moving object that once the energy was being created by the individual, it could be sustained, sustained longer, and sustained evenly. Leonardo da Vinci designed the original flywheel as we know it today. Leonardo da Vinci designed a lantern style wheel. What I mean by lantern style, it's larger at the top and smaller at the bottom. So to connect the two pieces of the wood, the bars had to be at an angle. So on a central column next to it, all these gears had to be at a different size to connect properly with the lantern wheel. As the workman turned the lantern style wheel, each one of these gears now turns at its own rate. Where do we use that every day? Every automatic transmission is based upon this principle. This is a General Motors 350 cubic inch engine. The reason that we introduced this into the exhibition is because we have the young school groups that come here, the young children, when they get hit with this, all this imagination, all this creativity, they have a hard time filtering this and putting all this together. And they think, how in the world does all this fit in my life? What does all this mean? What we've done is we've taken apart this General Motors cu uh, cubic inch engine. This here is what they call a camshaft. The only thing that's different between this camshaft and the cam hammer that we showed earlier is there was only one cam hammer. In here, we, they lined up 16 cam hammers is all they did. And they calibrated each one of these measurements as the cam hammer moves around to lift up the rocker arms, let the gas in and the exhaust out as the engine operates. Connected to the camshaft is we know what this is now, is Leonardo da Vinci's worm screw that connects the entire camshaft to the engine. On the side over here, is what they call a solid flywheel. The only thing that's difference between this flywheel and Leonardo da Vinci's original design is they took all the, all the pieces, all the weights, and they connected them in one piece. They didn't want extraneous objects floating around getting caught in the engine, so they took all the weights and they connected them and they balanced them. It's also called a harmonic balancer, but basically what it is, is a one-piece flywheel. Connected to the one-piece flywheel is Leonardo da Vinci's link chain that he designed for the bicycle 550 years ago. We've taken the head off the engine to expose the piston, and as you know, the piston is, is connected to the crankshaft. And as the gas explodes, it pushes the piston down, it turns the crankshaft and moves this thing forward. I want you to do this when you get a chance. I googled this the other day, and I asked, how many patents do you think General Motors has on this engine? General Meadows has over 3,000 patents on this engine. And every one of the patents that moves this engine forward, except for the spark plug, is from Leonardo da Vinci. Where do you hear this one? Over the last 300 years, Leonardo da Vinci has been credited with designing the automobile and foreseeing the automobile as we know it today. Everything was based upon this cart design and even our own explanatory notes say it was the automobile. Everything was based upon this design and the bent wood would be wound up and act like a spring-like mechanism. It would be wound up, it would slowly unwind like a spring-like effect. It would go 50 meters and stop. But we had nothing else to compare it to so we figured, well of course he meant the automobile. There was one design problem that we couldn't quite come to terms with. And that is if you sat or you stood on this cart-like design, it was very unstable. So if he meant this to be an automobile, it would have been very unstable, but we had nothing else to compare to. So we figured, well, of course he meant the automobile. Well, over the last four years at the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci, they're still putting together the pieces of the da Vinci puzzle. He had 44,000 drawings, of which only 14,000 survived. And plus, he was one of the greatest painters in the world that ever lived. And now they've now determined, you know what? He didn't invent the automobile as we know it today. When he moved from Italy to France, the last years of his life, King Francis I welcomed him with open arms to, to France. He gave him a place to stay on his own estate. He gave him a pension that he could live out the rest of his life in peace. The, Francis I was quoted as saying, the only thing I want is the pleasure of Leonardo da Vinci's company. 
And when Leonardo da Vinci arrived in France from Italy, he wanted to give the King Francis I an unbelievable gift that he could think of. Now we know it wasn't the automobile, but it was the bottom operating mechanism to his mechanical lion robotic design to the King of France. He designed a mechanical lion robot that was designed to be wound up, designed to go 50 meters. It was designed to roar up like a lion. And when it roared up like a lion, its chest was to open and flowers and lilies and doves were to fly out in tribute to the king. How cool is that? So we now know it wasn't the automobile that we always thought it was, but it was another one of his mechanical robotic designs that he gave as a gift to the king of France upon his arrival for welcoming him to France the last years of his life. I'd like to thank you for joining us today here at the Da Vinci Machines exhibition. But before we leave, I do have a couple of closing thoughts for you that I'd like to share with you. First of all, the name of this exhibit, which we named it, the Da Vinci Machines exhibition is what it is. But on all of our advertisement, on all of our themes, our, the theme of this exhibit is discover the Da Vinci in you. And why did we name it that? When I first got involved with this project over two and a half years ago, and I first realized that he had 44,000 drawings, of which only 14,000 survived, plus he was one of the greatest painters that ever lived. And we walk through this exhibit, we see these absolutely magnificent machines that brought us into the modern era. You know what I began to think about? What was in the 30,000 we lost? If you love this next story, in 1899, Charles Durrell, you can Google this guy, D-U-E-L-L, -L, Charles Durrell was head of the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, D.C. In 1899, you know what he, Charles did? He sent a letter over to Congress. And in his letter, do you know what he said? He said, you can go ahead and close the U.S. Patent Office because everything that had ever been designed, ever been dreamed, had ever been invented had already taken place. Wow, was that guy dead wrong or what? I'm a huge Beatle fan. And in this interview, this interviewer asked Mr. McCartney this great question. He said, hey, Paul, I got a question for you. Do you ever think there's ever going to be another Beatles? And what do you think Paul said? Paul said, of course there is. Just out of proportion to the number of people in the world. The human race is still at its infancy. Of course there's going to be another Beatles. Do you know what I ask the young students that come through every day? Do you ever think there's going to be another Leonardo da Vinci? And you know what the answer is? Of course there is. And do you know what I tell them? The next Leonardo da Vinci can be right here in this room. You don't have to do every day we, when we get up. We got to think outside the box. We got to dream, imagine, and create, and wonder. I've got three daughters. And they're all, one's, one's in the late teens, and my two in the early 20s. And you know what? They hate it when I tell them this. They love it when I tell them this. No, they hate it when I tell them this. You know what I tell them? I tell them every day when they get up, they have to turn off these iPhones. Because if you don't, I will decree from this day forward, nothing else in this world will ever happen. Because you know what we need? We need time to dream and imagine and create and wonder. Michelangelo had the greatest quote in history. You know what Michelangelo said? Michelangelo said the sculpture that he was about to create was already there inside the stone. It was just his job to break off the outside. How incredible is that? Do you know what this means? It means we all...